Language is the one main attribute that human beings possess that no other animals possess. I'm sure we have dogs that we can teach to have some sort of mimicking language, or parrots, or even monkeys, but they cannot communicate with language. Now, all languages are linguistically equal, but all languages do not have the same social prestige. For example, American English, and British English, and then if you go to Canadian English, the three of them have three different social prestiges when it comes to the world English. Now, all languages have the same five linguistic core areas. They have phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. First, let's talk about phonetics. Uh, according to Mehmet Yabis in 2006 in his book Applied uh, English Phonology, he said, phonetics is the study of speech sounds. Now, some linguists decided to create an international phonetic alphabet to represent all of the major sounds of all languages of the world. Because as you know, when we write sometimes, it doesn't represent all the sounds that a language can make. Now, human speech sounds, they fall into classes according to their phonetic properties. They belong to consonants or vowels. Now, according to the godfather of phonology, Peter Lederfolger, uh, in his book in 2007, Vowels and Consonants, he said there are over 200 different vowels in the world's languages and over 600 different consonants. Consonants can be categorized by three different aspects. The first one is the manner of articulation. For example, stops, which is like uh, the T at the end of cat, or nasals like uh, the N in N. It gets manipulated out of the nose. So that's a manipulation of airflow. Now also, it can be categorized by the place of articulation. Now this is like, for example, your bilabial, which would be your two lips, or your dental, which would be your teeth. Like for example, th, or b. These are examples of that. So it's basically where your tongue is placed. Also, consonants can be classified according to the sound that they make. They can be either voiced or voiceless consonants. Uh, for example, if you put your fingers to your throat and you say the consonant P, you hear no sound. If you say the consonant B, your vocal cords go blood. Now that you understand, uh, now also the vowels, these form the nucleus of the syllable, uh, mostly because they're surrounded by consonants on both sides. They can be categorized according to high, mid, low, according to the tongue height, and they can also be front, center, or back of the tongue. Also, they can be tense or lax, which basically means whether the neck, neck muscles are tense or whether they are lax. Now that we understand uh, phonetics, let's talk a little bit about phonology. According to Victoria Fromkin in her book in 2009, An Introduction to Languages, she said, phonology is the rules for combining sounds into words. Now, phonology tells what sounds are allowable in your own language, in which sounds cannot exist in your language. For example, in the English language, you'll never see the consonants T, S, and the vowel U. But in Asian language, this is a common pronunciation. Now, phonology can be broken down into two parts. There's the phoneme, and then there's the allophone. The phoneme, this is the basic form of the sound in your brain. For example, our alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. This is, we can all picture this. But the allophone, this is the different sounds that can be produced with these letters. For example, A can have the long A sound, or it can have the short A sound, the A. So it's represented by two different sounds. Actually, the English language itself has uh, 26 consonants with 44 different sounds that can be produced with these letters. Now, now that we understand phonology, let's take a look at phono uh, morphology. Now, morphology comes from the Greek word morph, which means to form, and logos, which means to uh, word. Now, morphology is basically the study of the structures of word. Now, one of the aspects of morphology is the morphine. Now, we're all familiar with it. We have prefixes, which come in the beginning. We have suffixes, which come on the end. We have infixes, which come in between. We have interfixes, which are whole words that are placed in the center of two other words. And then you have circumfixes, which are discontinuous morphemes, like the Somali language has lots of circumfixes in it. Also, we have the word formation process. There are many 
things that different languages use to actually uh, uh, utilize the language. You can do reduplication, like for example, the word like hanky panky, ding dong, it's like a reduplication of the word. You can have coining or invention. These are words that were never existed before that they came up with, like Yahoo, Google, Kodak, these sort of things. Um, also, you can have compounding. Compounding is like hot dog, girlfriend. You know, it's a combination of two words put together. Acronyms like CIA, FBI, UN, these sort of things. They, these letters represent different names. Also, back formation. These uh, change the part of speech of the word. For example, John and Mary went to the party, and then John likes the party. Party has two different meanings on it in this part of speech. You can also have blends, like the word smog is a combination of the words smoke and fog. Or you can have clipping, like for example, a larger word like mathematics, where most of the schools in that, they say that it is math. Now that we understand morphology, let's take a little look at syntax. Now, syntax actually comes from the Latin syntaxis, or from the Greek syn plus tasin, which means together and arrangement. Syntax studies the structure of the language and the rules for combining words into phrases and then phrases into sentences. Um, now, one of the teachers here at St. Cloud State University, Dr. Etienne Kofi, in his book in 2010, Applied English Syntax, laid out the architecture for the syntactic structures. He said, basically, the smallest unit would be the features, which would be like your tense, your voice, or your mood. It's not represented by words or anything like that. Then you have segments, which are small pieces of words. Then you have syllables, which is two or three combination with sound. And then you have your morphemes, which we've already discussed, which then go into words, which are your parts of speech, like verbs, nouns, uh, adjectives, prepositions, those sort of things. Then you go into phrases, then you go into clauses, and then you go into paragraphs, and then finally you go into discourse. Now that we understand syntax, or the structure of the language, let's talk a little bit about semantics. Semantics literally is the study of the word meaning. Uh, according to David Crystal in his book 2003, uh, an encyclopedia of the history of the English language, he says, etymology, the study of lexical history, words change within. History of a language, these are where the words originated from. For example, in English, we borrow a lot of words. We borrow from the French, we borrow from the German. It's a very open language that we borrowed many words to make a very rich lexicon. Now, lexical dimensions. Many different words exist in different languages. There's taboo words, there's swear words, there's jargon words, which actually belong to a certain field of study like biology. There's catchphrases, slogans, graffiti, slang, all of these things have their own uh, entomology where they came from. Also, there's semantic ambiguity, which means basically there are some things that uh, could mean more than one thing for a certain word. Uh, the one thing is we need to understand the truth condition of a sentence or a word. Uh, according to Elwood in 1977 in Logics and Linguistics, she said, one of the best ways to understand the meaning of a sentence is to imagine what the world would have to be like for that sentence to be true. Now, semantic features help us to organize all of these words that we've just learned in the language into basically our brain dictionary, so we know when to recall it. Now that we understand that, understand semant semantics, let's review the five different parts of speech that I just went over, um, which would all languages are made up of five linguistic characteristics, which we just went over. Phonology, phonetics, morphology, syntax, and semantics. If we look at the similarities instead of the differences of the languages of the world, we will notice that the main purpose of language is to convey information and is one of the factors that is unique to all human beings. Finally, I hope by introducing people to the basics of all languages that some people will look at the language as unique and creative and realize that all languages are linguistically equal. Thank you. I get the golf club. Huh?